a little bit of that, you know, forefront. But you see companies like ISS with a market capitalization of over a billion dollars. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out why. I, I think Tom Noonan's trying to figure out why too, but he's sitting there enjoying it at the moment. Um, but really, they wanted something because people have needs. A lot of people are very talented, and they're out there trying to start their own companies and trying to figure out what to do. And I'm kind of in the process of successfully doing that, for lack of a better term. So they wanted me to share some stuff. I mean, honestly, I'm not going to give you any of my business plan, you know, that would be damn stupid of a security professional to do, but although there are a lot of stupid security professionals, so never mind. Um, so we're going to talk about a little bit about the concerns. A little bit is like issues on how to hire people, which they were very concerned about, because if you have your own company, I mean, a lot of you I'm sure know, it's very hard to get really good qualified people. So we're going to talk about what to look for in people. And also, on the other hand, some people, you know, they're not at the stage where they can start their own company yet, and they're thinking about working for startups, which could be the smartest thing or the absolutely stupidest thing they ever thought of in their lives. So what we're going to do is also cover, you know, how do you know if a startup is a good startup or a bad startup? Because, again, it can be a big waste of your time and money. And, well, let's just get into the presentation a little bit. Okay. Wow. There I go. Many people want to start their own businesses. Um, we already did it. Next slide, please. Okay, a little bit about my background. Again, I'm not doing this to impress people. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of where I'm coming from, what my attitudes are, what my biases are, because, again, a little bit of what I'm talking about is specific to myself. And, you know, I mean, it's working for me. I think it can work for a lot of other people, but you have to make the decision. And, again, make the decision in an informed way. And what happened was I started out, I, well, actually, I guess I used my first computer in 1974. It was an IBM mainframe computer. And what happened was there was this, my best friend, his father worked for IBM as a programmer, and I used to go over to his house, and we played Star Trek on the IBM mainframe computer. Anybody ever remember that little Star Trek where you have line printers and, you know, would print out the block? and everything like that. I would go over to this guy's house and we would play Star Trek. We had one of those acoustic modems set, you know, set up and it would work at 300 baud or something like that and it looked really quick at the time. But the problem was every time we would do this, all of a sudden we'd go into a new sector and we'd be the Enterprise would be blown up by five Klingons you know, before we actually downloaded the stuff. So anyway, playing Star Trek wasn't as much fun as you would think it would have been. So what happened was, that was the first time I used a computer, and then after that I hated computers because my next thing was, in junior high school, you know, wow, this is dating me, but I guess it was like 1970, six or something like that, we had these, you know, they had this computer system, and it was like this computer, and you had to feed in punch cards. And, you know, punch cards are okay, except for the fact we didn't have a punch card puncher. We had to actually put in the opcodes with a paper clip on top of styrofoam. So needless to say, I kind of hated computers and wanted nothing to do with them. So then going on through there, when I got to college, so, you know, I worked for, I was a psychology major because it was the easiest major to get in all honesty. And what happened was I ended up doing some work for a professor and maintaining his databases. And then I ended up working for NSA. I started as an intelligence analyst. Again, intel, you know, innocuous term, but, you know, I was analyzing problems with communication systems, and that was my first stuff. And I started accidentally hacking computers. I mean, I was breaking into computers and not knowing there was like that was considered hacking. For example, um, one time, how many people were, ever used a Xenix computer system? You know, it's a PC-based Unix system, one of the first. There I was sitting there at night, and I was on shift work for NSOC, the National Signal Operations Center, a little compartmented office. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there screwing around, saying 25 reasons why I hate my boss. And all of a sudden, everything starts going Greek. You know, I thought, wow, this is kind of cool. I never saw Greek letters come out of a computer before. And then I'm like, wait a second, everything is Greek on the computer. I'm like, really scared, because I thought I just screwed up a major database system that we had there. So what happened was I called up my roommate, who luckily worked for the NSA computer support shop, and said, hey, um, he's like, it's 2.30 in the morning. What the hell do you want? I'm like, I'll buy you a pizza. Just tell me how to fix this thing. So then he goes, get the boot disk out of the system, hit control, alt, delete, then to, you know, FSCK and run the file system check and just answer yes to everything. I'm like, that's it? So anyway, everything got fixed. Everything was back to English, so I was happy again. And then I realized, wait a second, I could look at everybody's files. This is really cool. So anyway, that's what I did, not knowing there was anything wrong with it. Nobody ever told us at NSA at the time, gee, don't look at other people's computer files. But then anyway, as time went on, um, Another thing that actually gave me, I was really hated by the computer support branch for our division, they gave us this database that they spent three months developing. 
And it was pathetic. You know, we put in information we couldn't get back. So what happened? I decided, um, I'll just, I saw a package of of software on the shelf, DBase 3 plus software. I thought DBase, well, a database, you know, we kind of need a database. I put this, you know, loaded the stuff in, and over, you know, I was on shift work again, so over the midnight shift, I created my own little database. And I said, when I saw how pathetic this system was, I decided to design my own. Here's the benefits of mine versus the others. So my. T my team chief, being a brilliant military officer, couldn't figure out how to describe what I said himself, so he took my letter on how pathetic their system was over to the computer support branch and said, I redesigned something overnight that seems to be better than your system. So again, I was beloved by that group for a while. So, you know, that's how I started getting into this. And like I found out that what happened was those computer people didn't know much more than I did, but they got paid more. So I applied and got into the computer intern program. From there I did machine level crypt analysis, went ahead, did systems design, software testing, a lot of that. Next slide, please. And again, I'm just going to shoot through this, but you know, part of the big thing, a lot of system administration, much more than I ever wanted to do in my life or hope to do again. Acquisition management, again, you can read the rest. And I accidentally started commercial infosec, because one time I was like, you know, I was with a government contractor, and I was supposed to go down to the Pentagon, they're like, Ira, instead of going to the Pentagon today, make a few phone calls. I'm like, sure, what do you want me to do? And, you know, what happened was, they said, call up this company, find out who they use for an overnight carrier. Call up back, then call them back and find out what computer systems they have in the library. And I went, why? They're like, oh, we have a contract to find out as much about the company as possible without using the computers. I'm like, oh, who cares? Again, who cares what overnight carrier they use? Let's get their account numbers. And then who cares what systems they have in the library? Let's get logons. So they're like, gee, that's a good idea. And then three days later, using that stroke of brilliance, I took over an investment bank, and it was fun. And I started liking it because I don't know how many people worked at NSA, but a lot of what NSA does in computer security is not fun. You know, they developed the Orange Book series. Necessary evil, but writing security policies is not my idea of a lot of fun. So anyway, I thought, you know, up until that point, I thought security wasn't a lot of fun. But then I found out all this penetration testing was fun, so I started getting into it. And again, I wrote up the stuff. I got a reputation based upon my writings and conference series. Again, when you use puppets in an open forum, it kind of gets people's attention. Anybody see my Wizard of Oz presentation before? Oh, nobody. I'm. S yeah, he likes it. It's funny. So anyway, you know, so I, I give my presentations and kind of picked up. Next, please. So anyway, what happened was I started working for myself. I left government contracting. I got an offer from the National Computer Security Association. Had, you know, let's just say had several issues with them and stuff like that. But I had 30K of backlog because people wanted to give me work instead of me working for NCSA. At the same time, I couldn't accept it while I worked for them. But I also had like a nice offer from another company pending. I thought, what the hell? I can make $30,000 working on my own for like two months. If the offer takes three months to get it, I'm still well ahead of the pack. And what happened was the offer was slower and slower in coming, and I ended up just saying, wow, screw this. I don't care if I get that offer. I'm just going to be a consultant because it's fun not having to get up in the morning and show up in an office. I don't know if anybody has that privilege themselves, but once you have it, you don't want to give it up. I can guarantee that. So anyway, um, <laughs> it's kind of funny, but I didn't get business cards until about a year into the process. I just used my old NCSA business cards, crossed out the stuff, and wrote the new information on there. So finally, you know, I decided let's get business cards. I got a lot of clients coming to me, and now basically what happened was a little about probably a year ago now, people came to me and said, you know, you could get more work, there's a lot of companies making money, why don't you try to grow yourself into a real business? And that's what I tried to do. And now we're in the process of like looking at private placement money, getting venture capital and stuff like that. Also in the process, you'll find out you'll get several buyout offers. Whether or not they were real is one thing, because everybody likes to say, well, if you want to work for us, we'll give you like this. And honestly, half those offers are insulting. They think, wow, after he did, tries to get money for a few days, he'll give it up. And believe me, a lot of people do, and we'll talk about that next. So anyway, that's an example of where I'm coming from. When you start hearing my biases and things like that, again, you know what I'm talking about. Let's give the first example of a success, why everybody's all hot into doing security consulting, thinking they could be the next billionaires of the world. You know, Securify, how many people heard of them before? 
few people. It was started by Tahir Al Gamal, who was the chief scientist at Netscape, and he went ahead. You know, he's you know he's well known for developing the SSL protocol. Very very good cryptographer. And some people came to him and said, Hey, why don't you start your own consulting firm? And Tahir probably went, Gee, I don't know anything about consulting. I develop encryption. But they're like, Hey. We'll give you the money, we'll grow you, and we'll get you bought out, which is essentially what happened. At the time of their buyout, they had about 25 employees. According to sources, they reportedly had about a million dollars in sales a year. Yet, for some reason, they were about a $65 million acquisition after being in business for nine months. And, you know, you hear money like that, and everybody's like, gee, where can I grow up to be a consultant? So, you know how much money the people got is another story because obviously the investors gave them a lot of money to jumpstart them so that's another issue we'll talk about next please okay now we have success number two and everybody's heard of ISS internet security systems this is clearly one of the biggest success stories of information security what happened there Chris Klaus you know people have heard of him or know him now one of the 100 well I guess one of the top 25 richest people in technology he went ahead started a business in his grandmother's house what happened was he went you know he took this software which was essentially a Satan like software uh, I don't know again there's stories he put it together originally with Pete Shipley in some way shape or form but Chris took it and ran with it and eventually formed his own company off of it and that was kind of good everybody started getting excited about it and the smartest thing he ever did was got Tom Noonan involved again Tom Noonan is the CEO of um, ISS right now and he got his backing from he was an investment banker and he grew up and somehow I don't know how he got in touch with Chris but he did and he convinced Chris it's like here's how you do it you don't do this in your grandmother's house you don't do this in your grandmother's house anymore you go ahead we'll get you some seed money up front we'll get your offices we'll develop a marketing campaign behind you and then we'll go ahead and take the company public and again you know the first day ISS went public what was it sixty dollars a share after an offering price of like fifteen or something it was like astronomical oh no I'm sorry maybe it went up to forty hit a high of sixty then it was up to ninety after the security stocks went down a little bit you know went back up but again the market capitalization is hovering around a billion dollars which is really nothing to complain about next please now we have failure one, and I put failure in question marks because, again, this is what you have to decide. What's a failure for yourself? You know, personally, when you get my impression, I'm not going to work really, really hard and, you know, kind of take like a million dollars for it because, you know, you got partners. By the time you divide up a million dollars, you figure out how much salary you're giving up for a while. The million dollars really doesn't come out to be too much. It's like maybe it averages out to be 200000 a year, but you put your heart, your soul into a business, you put your identity into a business, and that, my identity and that of my partners is worth much more than that, I'll tell you. So anyway, you know, I look at this as pseudo failures because, again, and let me tell you really what's going on. Here's, you know, typical company really really great techies a lot of people know what they're doing there again some are better than others but overall they have really really good technical people working together and they grow one consultant at a time or it's one consultant at a time God willing they have a lot of people like to throw in the God willing they'll grow slowly but anyway they have that and they're billing you know ninety five dollars an hour which is seems nice but you have other consultants billing out for five hundred to probably on average two fifty an hour so you wonder but again they have fifteen people and they get a lot of buy out offers for about three million dollars a piece on average again it's all talk but I'm pretty sure if they really wanted to they could get three million dollars here or there but you know and again dozens of current consultant co consulting firms fit into this category right now again this is a lot of hard techies again they focus on providing good technology solutions and we'll talk about why that might lead to not as good market capitalization as they could next please Okay, next is a product development company. I had somebody come to me because he thought this was his company. Um, <laughs> but, um, oh no, sorry, no, not, not this one. This is a different one. Um, this is a case where you got really, really good techies with a really, really good idea. Again, in one case, well, this, again, a bunch of companies fit into here, but in one case you have a state of the art, you know, they have the best product on the market for this segment. And they have a great product, can't put anything against the product. They don't want to take investment money because they don't want to give up control. And in the meantime, what they're doing is they scrimp on the market and they don't need marketing. Their product is so good, it will sell itself, right? That's their claim. 
So anyway, they lose contracts because the customers fear they can't support it because they don't have a development staff. And sometimes, you know, they lose on price. They can't be as competitive because, you know, one sale is that much more precious to them than other sales. So if you're talking about an intrusion detection product, if they're competing against something like, you know, Cisco or Real Secure, ISS could be a little bit more price competitive. And again, they hang on by a thread. They're still, you know, not giving up. The people are going to be relatively well off. There's no question about that, but, you know, they're not really going to go anywhere quickly. Next, please. Failure three is a, more of a larger product developer. And again, failure in question, because you've got to think of what we're talking about on the scale. They start with private investment money, again, through lots of their own money. They had a lot of wealthy relatives, threw the money into their company. Did really well, you know, went ahead, put together big marketing efforts. A lot of people heard of their product, you know, hitting the right target audience. They turned down many buyout offers, which seemed very, very sincere. And from speaking to their potential acquirers, they were serious about the buyout offers because they had a good product. There's no doubt about the technical quality of the product. But they thought they were worth much more than that, of course. With companies like ISS, who their product was better than, they thought they could be the next ISS and were holding out for more. But what happened was the sales didn't match the marketing efforts, or the, let me say the marketing dollars they put into it. And the money got tight, and eventually they took one of the smaller buyout offers. And again, several, you know, several companies fit this category. So next, please. Let's talk about why these things occur. And these are business issues for owners. Again, it's broken up into you know, business issues for owners, you know, and then business issues for possible employees. Next, please. Okay, first is technology is secondary. People think if they have the best technical solution, the money will follow. I mean, what's the famous line? Build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. I don't know about you, but mousetraps don't have a lot of use these days, no matter how good the mousetrap is. So that's a major issue here. So the technology is one thing. The marketing is much more important than anything else. And really, the clients don't care about the best technology. They'd love to say they have the best technology. The reality of the situation is they're willing to accept for acceptable technology. Look at Microsoft. Again, you know, everybody, hackers have definite bad feelings about Microsoft, but let's look at why Microsoft is a success. They are marketing geniuses. There is no doubt about it. They bundle the product so well that if you buy Windows 98 for $100 more when you buy it with a computer, you also get the word processor, the spreadsheets, the database, and the PowerPoint presentations all bundled with it. So what happens in an organization like this where all the presenters prefer Unix over something like Windows 95, Jeff Moss gets all his presentations sent to him in Microsoft PowerPoint because that's what everybody has consistently. So again, Microsoft is brilliant because they have the best marketing. And again, technologies that aren't the best are okay because for most purposes you don't always need the best. You need acceptable. You need cost price comparisons. Again, there's cost and there's security and they balance off and wherever they balance off for a given customer is what people end up buying. Next, please. Next, businesses and interpersonal skills are probably the key. And again, if you're looking to taking on investment money or you're looking to grow your own company by yourself, knowing the industry is what matters most for you. You have to know what is your market. You have to know who are your competitors. You have to know if you go into a new market, who would your competitors be? I was actually on the phone with a potential investor today, and he's like, now I look at the market in these sectors. Who do you see as your potential competitors in each of those sectors? And off the top my head on a question I've never heard of before, I had to answer those questions out of the blue. And again, that's because I did research knowing somebody would take this into account. And again, when you're also talking about trying to differentiate your company from those companies of really good techies, you have to make yourself stand out. And I said charisma is part of a you know component of business success. And again, I'm talking about better success than just splitting $3 million among 15 people. Again, $200,000 is nothing to sniff at, but you have to look at, you know, what do you really want to put your money into? What makes companies okay companies compared to very, very profitable companies? And again, you have to take lessons at all costs. And what I mean by that is take lessons in speaking skills, presentation skills, marketing skills, because some of the best techies around, they are really, really good techies, but nobody teaches you, if you go for a computer science degree, how to present, how to present things. You know, even if you're a lot of people who are very, very well 
qualified don't have any college degrees whatsoever. I'm not saying that that's a negative from a technical perspective. However, part of your college degree is teaching you how to write. Some people have to take public speaking courses. Some people have to take other business related courses as part of their core curriculum. And those basic business issues become key when you're trying to grow a business. And again, also another issue, in order to start your own company, you have to have confidence in yourself. Because if you don't have confidence in yourself, you can't expect potential customers, potential investors, or whatever to have confidence in you either. However, there is a major, major difference between confidence and arrogance. Somehow, Bill Gates kind of overcame that. I don't know. But, um, you know, Ross Perot is another person that overcame arrogance. And there are a lot of people in the security industry, again, I don't want to put down specific people, but you see a lot of people walking around out there who are technical geniuses. But they are so good, it's like, wait a second. Unix is the best operating system. I'm not touching that NT crap there. It's like, OK, you're not going to touch NT? I'm sorry, my company has NT no matter what you say. You know, a lot of people just have preferences. And again, you've got to be able to deliver, but be perceived as a reasonable person. And also, you know, another issue, potential acquirers and customers, they don't care about what the latest buffer overflow is. Nobody ever asked me, gee, about that I.O. control problem that Microsoft just announced a fix for today. How do you consider that when this? It's like they don't care about that. They want to know who my competitors are. So anyway, that's a separate issue. Next, please. Number one problem, everybody repeat after me, cash flow. If you're ever starting your own business, these are the two magic words that you will never overcome until you get a lot of money in the bank. I know people with 15 person companies that are worried about cash flow on a regular basis. Because again, they always make the payroll, but sometimes it's damn close. If a check doesn't come one day and it comes in the next week, they might not be able to cover the payroll checks that are coming out the next week. And the thing is, it's, none, it's, none of their, it's, it's no fault of their own, but they have customers who bill out. And it's like, I have Fortune 50 clients. And their terms are, next 60 days or else screw you. That is their terms. If I want to take a large contract on from them, I have to deal with next 60 days. So what does that mean? I have to pay for plane tickets. I have to pay for supplies. I have to place scanning fee licenses. I have to pay for subcontractors. And I have to get them all there on my own dollar and hope that the company pays me within 60 days, because that's what my cash flow is budgeted out to. And believe me, sometimes these Fortune 50 clients it's like, oh, I'm sorry, that invoice got lost in our system. Could you fax it to us again? We'll put a rush on it. And a rush to them is two weeks in delivery. And that happens. So you got to prepare who you, you know, got to prepare to budget out your money. And that means that you got to prepare on saying, okay, well, I need to lease a computer, which means $40 a month here, which means I can get it next month as opposed to, you know, this month. But then sometimes you got to think, OK, I could pay this bill this month, but not this bill next month. Too many people get wrapped up in having to pay all bills at once. And you really want to do that. It irritates me that I can't pay my American Express bill you know, due upon receipt. I love to get that out of the way. You know, Sometimes you have to wait for that next check to come in. Just by the way, some people will, if you're a consulting business, have, they will take account receivable financing if you get the right bank offers. So just remember that, account receivable financing as a possible thing if you're a consulting firm. Um, oh yeah, also something I found out, get your credit card limits up as high as possible before you start spending lots of money up front. Again, I didn't think of that until it was too late. And then you're balancing things out. Pay, OK, I'll pay the minimum this month so I can pay the minimum next month. And then that keeps my payment schedule good so I could get more, you know, more loan or whatever. Next, please. But remember, cash flow. OK, next thing, the most important document of your business is going to be your business plan. You know, I thought, what the hell is this? It's just a bunch of paper that I'm not going to pay any attention to whatsoever. People want it there. Why do I need it? It's like, well, it makes you think. If it does nothing else, it makes you think who your competitors are. It makes you put down on right. It makes you gather enough information so that you know when all your investors come up with quick questions like, who are your competitors? If I want you to go into this industry, who do you think would be your strongest competitors there? 
Or who are your customers there? Could those types of customers use your services? And again, I'm doing, you know, I am coming off the top of my head with examples from service industries. However, it's the same thing for products, because products, they need a client base too. And again, it's like if you have an intrusion detection tool, who's your competitors for intrusion detection? Why is your product in this industry better than, your, than the other product in this industry? Stuff like that. You need the answer to those questions. And the hardest part that you'll ever find are the financials, because you have to figure out, gee, I don't have a clue once I get any money or whatever what my client base is going to be but yet they want me to know what my client base is going to be they want me to know the average sale they want me to know how much I'm going to charge how much plane fare is going to cost etc cetera, etc cetera. and again that makes you think but you got to really think this out through next please okay two things well I'll, I'll let you use a let in the printed format I have to do this but the way to remember this is opinions are like assholes everybody's got one that's the best way to describe it. And people have their own perspective. Again, I, you know, I met with somebody who was a potential investor a few months ago, and he started his consulting firm, and he sold his, you know, grew into a product company. But I said, you know, everybody's like, hey, you know, product, you know, service companies are growing, et cetera, et cetera. So I went to this guy, and he's like, oh, no, no, no. Here's what you got to do. This is the way I grew my company. I grew my company one employee at a time, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, this product fell into my lap, and all of a sudden became a product company. But you want to be a service? company so therefore this is how you should do it because that's the way I did it it's like okay then why is everybody else really interested in consulting firms all of a sudden it's like he that's his opinion another person I set my plan to oh well you know all your partners nobody they're not worth anything you know I'm like you know I'm like listening to this guy and this guy's like wait a second what did you bring to your company you brought less to your company and you're saying these people bring to my company so you know that's your opinion you know, you can get lots of opinions from different people, some good, some bad, but again, remember to take it all in and use common sense and use discretion and be realistic, because some people have better opinions than others, and you got to think about what sounds logical. Because one thing is, you're all going to know what you want people to tell you, but they might not tell you the truth, you know, what you really need to know. So again, listen for everybody and pick apart the pieces that are valid most for you. And part of the issue is, now this is especially true if you're in a product-related company. If you're in a product-related company, investors, I mean, and you definitely need investors in a product-related company because you have to have developers develop software for long periods of time before you have something to market. But investors, and especially if you're going to work for one, remember this, investors would rather take a risk on the technology than on the market for the technology. So in other words, what you're saying is you could say, I have the greatest technology in the world. It does this, blah, 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 blah. Then it's like, and if I have a marketing budget, I could let everybody know they need this product. Or on the other hand, somebody could come to them and it's like, look, I have this idea for a technology. It goes in this market, which is definitely huge. You know, people are spending money already. If I could just take this technology and make it, and make it wonderful and make it real, everybody would come to my door. They would rather invent, invest in that second company with an with a idea than the other company with a product in hand if there's no market. So again, think about market, big thing. Next, please. One thing, people forget about this, especially a lot of people in the security industry for some reason. You know, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of arrogance, there's a lot of pettiness between a lot of professionals. I don't like it, but it exists in this industry. You better learn to be as nice as possible. Because, you know, you need help on the way up, you know, and once you're on the way up, you better continue to be nice because a lot of people end up going on the way down, too. And so the people you're not nice to on the way down will remember it when you, I'm sorry, the people you're not nice to on the way up will remember it when you're on your way down, and they will let you know about it. But again, you never know who you're going to need in the future. Be nice to everybody whether you like them or not, which is probably one of the hardest things about growing a business. Next, please. Marketing, and again, Every, pro every company has, has to have their own marketing strategy. And again, it's specific to your company, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to either differentiate yourself from your company or get in their faces. So in other words, if you have, what's a good thing? 
let's say, a lot of security consulting firms around, and again, I'll pick those nice little 15-person companies there. Somehow, some 15-person company has to differentiate themselves from another 15-person company. So when somebody looks on the internet and says security consultants, and they have to pick one person versus another, they're going to pick the person who seems like a better marketer, whether or not they're technology. And again, you can market that you have better technologists, you just have to have some marketing plan. Or else, what you have to do is you have to get name recognition. I mean, there are a lot of companies I hear of, I mean, I don't know if their people are good, bad, and different, but I hear about them, so at least there's a name I know about compared to a name I don't know about, I'm more likely to go to the name I know about. And again, just because I know it. So again, you're trying to get name recognition. And also, I like to say attract publicity in positive ways. I also have a column on you know, ZDTV, which is a website, www.zdtv.com. It's also a television network if you get the different cable stations. And every so often, we get contacted by security companies who find a new vulnerability in this product. And they, you know, and some of the reporters come to me. It's like, Ira, what should we do with this? This, these people have found a product, a, a problem in Windows NT, and they want to let us know about it because they want to announce it to the world on Wednesday. However, they don't want us to let, Mi they don't want us to tell Microsoft about it. I'm like, why not? It's like, well, they think if it's fixed, it's not big enough news. And which is actually, I can tell you, it's actually true. I found a significant vulnerability in Yahoo, Excite, and Hotmail with millions of users. I could have went out and publicized the hell out of it. All these places are vulnerable. And I would have put millions of people at risk because of a vulnerability. Instead, I chose to contact Yahoo, Excite, and Hotmail. When they didn't respond back, I called my friend at USA Today and said, on Wednesday, I'm going to let people know about this. Yahoo, Excite, and Hotmail already know about it. I want you to call them up to see what they're going to do, because I'm a nobody in their eyes, so I need USA Today to find out what they're going to do. So anyway, USA Today said, hey, this is a great story. You know, we'll get there, you know, we'll tell them about it on Monday. We'll have, see if they have a chance to fix it. So anyway, something happened on Monday. I think it was Monica Lewinsky, damn that bitch. And <laughs> what happened was, all of a sudden, I'm sitting there. And, you know, it's not in USA Today. I'm like, well, you know, it'll be the next day. Well, anyway, it finally runs on Friday. And I'm like, you know, the, the reporter called me up. He's like, you know, Ira, sorry, I hate to tell you this, but what happened was all these places fixed it, you know, Wednesday, like you said. So it wasn't as big of a story. Now there's a pro you announced a problem that is no longer a problem, so it's a non-issue. But again, some people want to take the publicity. It's like, okay, big deal. But other people want to get the publicity by screwing people. And again, announcing a vulnerability with no solution available is screwing people. But it makes a bigger name for themselves in the press. So anyway, attract publicity and attract a lot of it if you could. And again, what I mean is, that you can go to the next one, but write papers, start writing articles, do things to get your name out. How, I mean, I'm famous, what, people don't know if I'm good or bad. I kind of think I'm really good and so do my customers. But people, you know, people that hear me speak, I say the right things, they think I have a clue, which is a good thing, and that's how I got a reputation. And again, let people know you're good. Write good articles, write articles that tell people how to do positive things, not negative things. And that's the way you can attract attention for yourself and your business. Remember to do it and do it in a positive way. Help people, give away help for free. Next, please. Okay, funding sources. First of all, private money. This is a question of how much do you have? If you want to have your own company, you know, some people want to do the friends and family route. They go ahead, they borrow against their house, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'll tell you one thing, these people have a lot on the line. If they don't produce a su successful company, they are screwed because a lot of these people mortgage their house and stuff like that. You've got to realize that usually when people self-fund themselves, they're probably talking about $100,000. Which is okay, but what happens, it seems like a lot of money, but when you start thinking about it, you have to pay salaries, you know, you might have to take on other employees, and those employees might not want to defer the income because you didn't give them a piece of the business, you're hiring them as employees, so you have to pay somebody $5,000 a month here, you have to pay for your ISP hookup, you have to pay for marketing, you have to pay for plane fare to market clients, et cetera, et cetera. You know, $100,000 burns up quickly, so remember that. And also allows for small growth. But again, you should do what's right for you. If you just want to work on your own with no problems, take that route. There is nothing wrong with not making a lot of money. You should, I mean, again, remember, sorry, I don't have this in here. But if you remember nothing else, your goal should be what makes you happy. If your goal is currently to make as much money as possible to make yourself happy, then by God, do it. If your goal is to work on your own, this isn't a bad route. You might not be rich very quickly, but again, next slide, please. 
private placement money. This is also referred to as angel investors. And this is where you try to find rich friends, you know? <laughs> And sometimes, you, you know, sometimes there's help, like if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, there's the Potomac Knowledge Way, I think they go by. There's probably a bunch of little angel funds around. If you're familiar with Garage.com, Guy Taka, what's Guy's name? Kawasaki. Yeah, Guy Ka Yeah, sorry. I, I kept thinking that was a motorcycle, not a person. But anyway, Guy was there, and, you know, he has Garage.com, which, you know, encourage people to do. I think there's a sign-up fee. But if that's what you're looking for, go ahead. Typically, these people will probably donate around $250,000 on the top end. Some people might donate up to 500 k but that's like the higher-end people. Like, this, that's the sort of private placement money that somebody like Jim Bidsos might put towards a company if he really, really likes it. But in general, you're probably talking about a quarter million dollars for most people. And also, remember, Remember, everyone has their opinions. So, and how many people saw Pirates of Silicon Valley last week? Or a few weeks ago? It was a pretty good movie. I don't know if it was true or not. It seems true. We almost hope it is, because, you know, it's like you're really glad Steve Jobs got screwed after watching that movie. But anyway, you know, Apple was turned down by HP is one of those things that came out, because HP said, now who is going to need a computer in their home? And they threw them out of the office, but they had to go to them under contract. And HP said, and the happiest, and they were delighted when the guy came back. It's like HP didn't want it. They were celebrating to their heart's content because everybody, because they had private investors. Next, please. Then you have venture capitalists, and they'll give you a lot of money. I mean, typically, depending on the venture capitalists, some of them start at two million, some of them start at two hundred fifty thousand, whatever. A lot of the larger ones want to start at five million, but they want more in return. I mean, angels are kind of like, okay, friends, they'll, you know, they might give you, when your company's worth next to nothing, you know, they'll give you like, you know, 250000 say, hey, I want 5% of your company. Venture capitalists, on the other hand, love to screw you. You know, they'll say, okay, well, here's, this is literally how they fix it. They'll say, we'll give you our company without our money, an arbitrary value of $2 million. You want $2 million, so therefore, that, you know, we're giving you $2 million out of $4 million, so we want 50% of your company right off the bat. If you're in the position where this is a critical thing, I'm not saying this is good or bad, but remember, they will try to screw you. They will give you every, after courting you, sorry, somebody just told me but their experience, but after courting you, you know, they'll make you sound, oh, we love you, we love this, we love this about you, you're wonderful, blah, blah, blah. Then they come down to sign the forms. <laughs> you worthless piece of trash, you think you're worth this? Hell no, hell no. You know, it's like, we'll give you this and you should be happy and lucky to get this in peace. And they will try this right and left, so you got to look at that. And again, they'll give in the millions, but they have their preferences. Again, different people want to invest in different things. Some venture capitalists are looking for specific companies and in specific industries to invest in. You know, sometimes venture capitalists shop around for good people because they have an idea, then they hope the good people can fulfill their vision, and obviously they'll give those people like next to nothing for doing that sort of stuff. I personally, my, my opinion is that's kind of probably the Securify deal. Anyway, also investment bankers are very useful to help find these people and also help negotiate with them. Next, please. As far as investment bankers, they help you find money sources. These are people that don't have money of their own, but they help you find and manage it. Because again, there's a lot of legal issues going around. They have to package and format things for you. They have to get your business plan in acceptable format. And if you're just starting out on your own, writing a business plan that, and you've never dealt with investors before, writing a business plan is a very, very difficult thing. I mean, you have your idea of the greatest business plan in the world, and it might, and honestly, you know, I thought I had a good business plan. They just totally tore it apart. They're like, this is totally not what people are looking for. And they were probably right, and now we have a damn good one. But anyway, what happens is they'll help you find and raise money. And the problem is there are some that, there are, well, let me phrase it this way. There are some investment bankers that will help you raise money, but they go to your, you know, people you think want to give you money. Those are kind of semi-useful. Then you have other ones with their own funding sources. They know people. They know the industry and stuff like that. And if you go out and find them, they'll help you a lot more than the other people will. However, they'll probably want more in return. 
And I like to say, look for an investment banker that has a good reputation. Like, who else did they help get money? Who else did they help grow a business? It's because what the venture capitalists are going to look for, they're going to say, am I dealing with a bunch of idiots or am I dealing with people that know what they're doing? And again, the, ven the investment bankers will help, you know, I mean, you know, they'll help keep the venture capitalists under control when they, they try to screw you over. So anyway, and what you should expect if you deal with an investment banker, they probably want a fixed fee. You know, I've heard of fees from like 10K. Just as an example, when I spoke to Price Waterhouse, their offer was something like they wanted $35,000 up front, then 5% of all the money they raised, and then like 10% warrants or something like that. You know, that's an awful lot of money when you're talking about a few million dollars. So, you know, that's just one thing. Then other ones, like one guy wanted $10,000 and then 6%. You know, things like that. Again, it's a balancing act, but you have to figure out what's right for you. And again, look for lots of investment bankers. And a lot of the better ones, you don't, they're not going to give you this impression, but remember that they work for you. You know, they're the type that, oh, well, you know, anyway, remember that they work for you. Next, please. Okay, problems you're going to face. Okay, first of all, putting together a good team. Nobody is going to do well by themselves. Again, you know, Bill Gates ran a great company. He didn't do well if it wasn't for Paul Allen, I think his name is. Again, Chris Klaus started a good company. He was, work, you know, he had a good, he was a great technologist with, that would go nowhere if it wasn't for Tom Noonan. What you need are complementary skills, and how you find that is figure out what your weaknesses are. Are you a good business person? Are you good in front of people? Do you write well? Do you talk well? Do you present well? If you have that, well, then figure out where you need yourself supplemented, because you're not going to be able to do it on your own. And again, realize that what you need are business skills. Again, a lot of people in here, I'm sure, are very, very, very good technologists. But you need the people who understand the business to run your company. And that's a key aspect. And then you also got to look at what would be the perception of your team. Is your team well-rounded? Is somebody really good, but they don't have a reputation, and that might hurt your company in the long run? So again, it's a balancing act to consider. And again, one thing I, well, look for contacts. Again, you know, that's obvious. And now, key thing I like to say, and this is more one of those touchy-feely issues, but you got to look at, is your team programmed for success? And what I mean by this is, I've actually seen it with one of my par well, former partner, I'll phrase it that way. What happened was, all of a sudden, we we're like, you know, on the brink of being successful, and then all of a sudden, he started screwing things up. You know, he would just like, you know, just went to, oh, this doesn't feel right. That doesn't look right. No, I don't have the time to meet with you this week. No, you know, canceling meetings at the wrong moment. And again, people who are programmed for success means that they expect and want to be successful. Some people, for all their lives, have, are used to working for other people. And again, you don't appreciate the difference until you do it on your own, but people who are used to working for other people aren't comfortable in having to re rely on themselves for a change. And again, you're not going to believe this until you witness this in person, but I guarantee you when you start doing this thing, if somebody isn't quote unquote programmed for success, they're going to start screwing up and ruining things just when you're about to be successful or right before key meetings. So you want to make sure your people are committed and that you actually think mentally they're prepared to be millionaires next week or whatever. Next please. Okay, partners might come and go. Like I started getting into a little bit. First of all, put one person in charge. Well, I had the first partner is like, okay, we're working together and it's like, okay, you know, really, quote unquote, I would be in charge, but we make decisions as a team. We talk to somebody else and he'd be like, well, you're in charge, but you're saying you're working together as a team, yet he says one thing and you're kind of saying the same thing, but you're saying it differently. It makes me concerned. And again, we were working together well on most issues, but when, you know, if you have a team of two people co-managing something, and all of a sudden, if there's a slight difference, potential people will lose confidence in you as a team. And that's a key aspect. And again, this is a bad thing, but get everything in writing as soon as possible. If you're expecting people to contribute money to in equally, get that in writing. If you're expecting people to contribute their time equally, get that in writing. If you expect people to quit their job at a given point in time, get that in writing. Those are issues. And again, study the level of commitment, the risk that they can take, because some people just don't want to take risks. It's like they're happy to go. If you say, I'm going to have a pot of money here in August, it's like, great job. I'll work with you in my spare time, and when we get that pot of money, I'll quit my job. It's like, no. Nobody wants to invest in a company where partners are working half time. You know, that's one issue. You believe they do not want to invest in somebody. If you don't have enough confidence to work in your own company full time on your own wiles, then they don't have any confidence in you either. So that's how they look at it. 
And again, spare time contributions are nothing. Don't worry about who's contributing the money. Look at who's contributing the time. Because there's a difference in giving spare money. Because a lot of people these days, I mean, you know, I'm not going to ask a poll, but there are a lot of people in this industry making like, you know, 80, 90, of over $100,000. They have a lot of money to put in the bank. They have a, like $30,000 to contribute. But until they're ready to leave their company and give up that $120,000 a year job, they're nothing to you. Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> you can't tell I learned my lesson. Next, please. Okay, everything will take a lot longer. This is a hard issue to deal with. Everybody, you know, I should have had my millions, but when was it? Last December now. So here it is, July. Anyway, things are still progressing, but they're a lot slower than I ever thought they would be. Get used to it. And again, what's the two magic words? Cash flow. Good. Okay, next. <laughs> Never make promises too on time. Next, please. Focus. Every investor wants to see that you have a clear focus. They would rather see a tight focus than a too broad focus, because if you're too broadly focused, they don't think you'll be successful at anything. You know, have the investors, if they want to invest in you, if they think your focus is too narrow, let them tell you. Otherwise, a lot more investors will turn you away without giving it a second thought if they think you're unfocused. That's a key decision. Next, please. Difficult clients. These are your worst nightmare. How many people ever had difficult clients if you're on your own? Or even if you're not on your own? These people aren't worth your time. I had one client I negotiated a contract with for a year. I'm not kidding. And then once we got the contract in place, he wanted eight revisions to the final thing. And finally I just said, I'm not making any more revisions. Or he wanted, would have wanted easily a ninth and tenth revision. Again, walk away. It ends up not being worth it in the long run. Make sure you bound your contracts tightly. And again, while we're talking about, make sure you don't bite off more than you can chew. Because if you're growing, you might want to grow a lot quicker than you can. And sometimes you really need money desperately because your cash flow is at a point. But you've got to be prepared to turn away work. Because if you screw up and you're really tight on cash flow, you take a job because you're tight on cash flow and you can't fulfill it, you might screw everything up. So again, don't do that. Next. Carpetbaggers, these are the biggest pain in the butts I probably have to deal with. I don't know about other people consulting or security or software wise, but again, this is, I call carpetbaggers established companies. For example, big five firms. I don't mean anything negative against by the term carpetbaggers, but they are a major competitor. And they're in every client I have. And they keep trying to say, oh, don't worry about Ira, he's good, but we have a full team of world experts who can do it. We have Ira times 28, like, yeah, right. But anyway, that's what I have to deal with. And they'll say, oh, by the way, we're cheap. we can be cheaper than Ira, too. You know, it's like, oh, good, you're cheaper than me all of a sudden. Then you find out what they're giving you, and they're giving you, you know, an accountant with like two years out of college and an ISS to run against their systems. That's their penetration test. You know, for those of you that know that's a hard penetration test, that's what I deal with for a big help. Oh, Fortune 5 firm, I had one of the big five firms offer a 5K penetration test for a job that was obviously 20K just because they wanted to do everything to keep me out of the client. And again, they can do that. And chances are they're going to state larger fees, but you know, they say they, you know, their experts go for $5,000 a day. Really what those people are getting is about $2,000 a day because their clients won't pay it. Anyway, some of their people are outstanding. I don't mean to take anything against them. Like, for example, George Kurtz is clearly one of the better professionals I've seen perform penetration testing. He's going to be giving a presentation today. However, remember, if you go to EY, make sure if you want a good penetration test, I'm not saying there aren't other good people, but if you want George Kurtz, write in the contract, you want George Kurtz. And he'll get more money for it, too. Next, please. Okay, carpetbaggers continued. They infer that many of their employees are skilled just because they work for them. Oh, we wouldn't hire people who are scummy. We wouldn't hire untrained people. Our people are the best of the best. You're yeah, right. Also, another thing, like, you know, some of the firms, like systems integration firms that do government contract, anybody work for them? You know, no offense to you if you do, but I'm just saying. If you work for them, a lot of their marketers in the commercial sector will go around telling you, hey, we do security for the Department of Defense. We work for NSA. We work for here. Obviously, we know security. Now, if you've seen some of the latest web hacks against, you know, the Army, the military, is actually working for the Department of Defense a good reference? You know, and again, I'm not saying their people are bad. Again, many of these firms have really, really good security people. But that is no justification that all their people performing the work for you are any good. Again, if you want specific people, demand the specific people or don't pay. <clears throat> anyway, 
Um, and again, they're not bad, but a competitive threat, and you've got to realize that. Next, please. Um, also, one thing, everybody comes out of the woodwork. Everybody wants a piece. That's a bad thing. i to make sure I keep on pace. Anyway, you know, people, investment bankers, lawyers, whatever, they all want a piece. Get really good advisors to tell you who's good, who's bad. Next, please. Early buyout offers, they become really, really tempting after you like poured 40, 50,000, whatever it is, into your company. Somebody comes up, I'll give you three million right now, you come to work for me, guarantee two years, you know, no questions asked. It's like, yeah, but your company sucks. But anyway, you know, that's another issue. They become very tempting, but be prepared to deal with it. Next, please. Who do you trust? This is another issue. Again, people come out of the woodwork. You know, if you give your business plan to, you're thinking about hiring somebody, taking somebody on, make sure these people, you know, do research on them before you even tell them your business plans. Because you'd be, so, I met some nice people who I tried talking to, and little pieces of information leak out in certain ways, and you kind of figure out where they come from. But get references. Many people really talk a good story, but you got to look at who really is a good story. And look for what they deliver, not for what they say. Look for background. Look for clients they could bring in. You know, if they're a product developer and they know it, look for what products they've developed before, things like that. And again, listen for how well they fulfill the promises they make to you, especially when you're growing your own business. Next, please. Hiring issues. Very skilled people are hard to find. I'm sure you know that. Go to acquaintances. There's no magic secret there and ask around. Key thing is be prepared to train. And next, please. Major issue is because I would rather see somebody with great basic diverse computer skills. Here's my philosophy. How many people ever heard of karate masters, you know, like super black belts or something? What does the term master actually infer? They, that they have mastered something. What have they really mastered? They have mastered, perfected the basic moves of karate. They're really good at the basic moves. And if you're really good in any part of the computer profession, I will argue that that is because you are great at the basic skills of computers as a whole. You're good at programming, you're good at structure design, you're good at analysis, you're good at you know implementing systems, whatever the basics are, you're good at. And if you're that good, you can use those skills for a security perspective. And so again, look for people, you know, here's the magic test. Ask somebody from here where, they're, where they park their car. If they can picture where they park their car, that tells you they have good visualization skills, and usually people with good visualization skills tend to be better computer people. My psychological background. Anyway, um, also skilled administrators and skilled network engineers are really, really good. I mean, I find if you get a good, you know, even though they're not a security engineer, a security network person, if you get a brilliant administrator or a brilliant network engineer, they will be the best people security-wise you ever have because they know the basics. And again, you might have to train them in the ba in the specifics of security, but if they have the basics, the rest will flow easily. And also, this is just my own philosophy: security is not a technology. It's a process, you know, from developing a secure product to securing an entire organization. It's a process. It's not specific to a technology. Remember, next, please. Hiring hackers. This is a big thing. What we are saying here is people want to, you are looking to hire somebody because they have the identity of a hacker. You don't want to hire identities. You want to hire people with skills. So what is, what are the skills this hacker claims to have? Not they're a hacker and they break into systems and people get pissed at me for saying this, but monkeys can be trained to break into systems. Again, it's not hard to break into a computer. But again, check out the skills if they were not taught or, well, I mean, well, let me ask this question. If somebody says they're a really good hacker, they can break into all these computers, how do you know? If they have a police record, you might be able to tell. That's not a good perform. That's not a good employee characteristic. And if they haven't done this, they're admitting to criminal acts. So again, don't hire hackers. And I don't say don't hire somebody who claims to once been a hacker or claims to be a hacker. Hire people who have the skills you need. Like they administered their own network. They ran an ISP. They did whatever. You're hiring skills, not identities. And again, there, there is the implication here that if you do hire a hacker, it could have negative repercussions. Honestly, if I have good people, I'd rather hire the good people and let the chips fall where they may, but that's a separate issue that I've chosen to take, not everybody. Next, please. Intelligence experts. This is my next, I mean, this is my bigger pet peeve than hiring hackers. How many people have ever heard an intelligence expert? I worked at NSA. I tell you, but I have to kill you, they say in a joking manner. Those are the biggest assholes you will ever meet. Anybody that ever works for NSA, again, I worked for NSA, had literally at any point in time, I had 20 plus special compartmented clearances. And I could tell you, I did machine level cryptography. I went ahead, did systems level, I did systems development on a communication system. I went ahead 
had programmed in this language, tested in that, administered those networks. I can tell you skills I have. People who tell you that they can't tell you the skills because it's classified are, well, full of crap. Well, I'll phrase it, I'm being nice about this. Anyway, anyone, you know, you gotta watch out for this because these are the biggest things. And again, some systems integrate, say we have intelligence professionals. Find out what those intelligence professionals did. Because remember, NSA hires janitors too. So just because they were a janitor at NSA doesn't mean they're a security professional. So next, please. Name droppers, that's another thing to look out for. Anybody say, oh, I know these people. Yeah, I'm cool. Hey, I know those people. I, I, I had lunch with him. Doesn't mean crap. That's pretty much what it amounts to. Look for people who they can rely upon their own skills, not who they know. I guess unless, of course, they're a scummy marketer. You need scummy marketers who know people. But see what they deliver. Next, please. Okay, the situation, when you work for a private company, when you work for your own company or a startup, you take a lower salary, but you should have more equity. And this is if you're going to work for somebody else. And the real wealth, when you look at a startup, it's like when Amazon.com started up, Amazon.com was worth nothing, right? You know, but these people took equity. Some people worked for pizza, literally, but that was okay. The earlier you get in, the more risk you're taking, but you should get more equity. And you have to decide personally if it's worth it to you. Next, please. Look at yourself. Can you take the financial risk? Do you have a family that needs your salary? Is there money in the bank, living costs? Are you flexible skill-wise and talent-wise? Because if you're working for a startup, you might have to go from programming one minute to marketing the next. And you've got to be prepared for that. And again, look at what's important to you. What's the stage of your job? Next, please. And again, look at the company. This is not, are you managing cash flow? This is, does the company have cash flow? And even if they don't have cash flow, are you aware of the situation? Like, for example, you might not be paid for month A, B, C, and D, or whatever. But be aware of that ahead of time and know the risks you're taking up front. Next, please. And more importantly, look at the company and the management. Are they realistic? Do they have good business plans, et cetera, et cetera? Do they know the competition? Do they size them up? Well, that's key. And again, remember to look at the business plan and ask to speak to whoever they're working with. Again, if I have people working with me, I'll, you know, I encourage them to talk to the investment bankers, the lawyers, the accountants I'm talking to. Make sure they let you do the same thing. Don't tell them, oh, that's sensitive. I can't let you. No, make sure peop good people support your people. And again, check out the references of the people you plan to work for. Are they good as they claim to be? Next, please. Do they understand the technology and can they deliver? Even though business skills are important, they better have technology underneath. And do they understand marketing? That's a key thing. Thought processes make sense. Again, think of it this way. If you're working for a business, you've got to make sure the business is good, sound business from a business perspective. Even if they're the most brilliant technologists in the world, you need good business people running your company because you're betting on those people, because you're betting on that equity, because you're going to probably go from possibly taking an $80,000 a year job to a $30,000 a year job because you want that equity. You're hoping you're working for the next Amazon.com. Next, please. Pretty much it amounts to, do you believe they can pull it off? And what you have to look at is, don't look at the hype and the respect you have for the people. Because a lot of people think, I really respect that person. I want to work for that person. But again, you've got to look beyond that and say, do you trust that person to be able to pull off a business? And that's a bigger issue. Next, please. Okay, will they catch the wave? This is an issue that too many people are failing to miss. Everybody says, I can develop a great firewall. Firewall, a new firewall company today will not be very successful for like long-term business growth. Again, I'm overgeneralizing, but the way for firewall companies, the firewall industry is consolidated. You really have met, possibly missed the wave. It's probably becoming true for intrusion detection systems as well. Look for the next technologies. Maybe in the next wave to catch is like public key encryption or whatever. Next, please. And remember, one thing, two magic words. Cash flow. Remember that. And again, be, if you're running your own company, be realistic about what your chances are. And again, what's the magic term? You've got to keep dreaming, you know, reaching for the stars while keeping your feet on the ground. you really got to do that because, again, you've got to be confident, but you've got to have your ego in check because people want to trust you because you're confident, but they're not going to trust you because they think you're an arrogant fool. There's a big difference. It's a fine line, but a big difference. Just remember, I have a strong summer. Any questions? Sorry. I think I'm just on. Yes? What about the certifications on IRMP? How much do they play the role? This is a personal opinion. Personally, for me, a certification, I would say, is okay. It shows that the person has 
I mean, honestly, like the CISSP, I have the CISSP. I think it is good because it shows that somebody has taken enough in interest in the profession to work for three years or to somehow manage to justify their work for three years in the profession and have said they want to stay in it and put time for it. Although, on the other hand, there are some awfully damn good people that would never get certified. So, again, CISSP shows dedication, but on the other hand, it shouldn't be excluding people who are damn good. Anything else? Oh, yeah, sorry. Actually, the same question, but in terms of customers. Do customers look at, you know, if you're a small consulting company that people don't really know you, do they look more towards the certification? That depends on your marketing. If you go ahead and say, I'm a small company, but I have damn good people, let me bring in my people and let them let me have my people talk to you and show you their skills, show you their knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. That's one thing. But again, you're dealing against companies like Secure Computing, for example. It's no secret they have a major push to have, you know, CISSPs and Price Waterhouse, I think, says we have the most CISSPs in the industry, although nobody can justify that claim. Um, you know, I'm not saying it's not true, I'm just saying it, you can't prove it's true because nobody gives out that information. You know, it's sort of like we have the largest number but the lowest percent. Um, you know, if you make it a discriminator to a customer, it will be. Again, I worked for NCSA when they were doing the firewall certification. And we had some people that didn't want to be certified and had damn good reasons not to be certified. But they, you know, what happened was their competition went to potential customers and said, hey, we're certified, they're not. It's like, well, certification might not mean too, too much, but it means we are dedicated to the industry, we invest in the industry, and we meet certain standards. I don't know why that other firewall company isn't meeting those standards, but you know, don't they not want to spend the money to the industry? Do they not want to make sure their product is secure? Again, it depends on how good your marketing is. Yeah. Sorry. Where do you find a good marketing person, and um, how do you qualify them since you can't believe anything they say? <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's a good thing. Again, you look for friends. There are people in the industry who, you know, again, like who I know, who are excellent marketers. You know, again, it's through contacts, it's through people, at, not necessarily this conference per se, but a lot of conferences where you go to meet people who, you know, come in and market the products. Some people are awfully damn friendly. They look good. Ask them what their figures are, what they produce. Do they want to work for a startup company and stuff like that. But again, you can get a feeling for who the best are, and then ask to speak to who they sell to. Because I had one case where, you know, great marketers had lots of great numbers, like with a specific firewall company, as an example. But I spoke to the customers, and they're like, he's the biggest asshole in the world. So, you know, again, you got to look at both sides. But I would have wanted to hire him. He went somewhere else, but would have wanted to hire him, except, you know, because I looked beyond one, what one people said and said, well, his numbers prove he can be successful as long as he doesn't give me the reputation of being an asshole. Anyway. Sorry, yeah. You uh, mentioned uh, walking away from uh, difficult uh, clients, basically. Mm -hmm. Don't you feel that that gives your competitors a foothold? I would rather have my competitors with a foothold with a difficult client than having anything to do with them. I had one client, again, I had some people who wanted me, Ira, you know, this major financial company said, we want to have you. I'm like, okay, I will do it. They're like, I, they signed the contract the same day I faxed it out. I don't think they read it. Then what happens is they thought, well, we want this. You know, you're, you're charging us for quarterly assessments, and we just need, you know, and then you're not signing off on our assessments. I go, I can't sign off on the assessments. You have problems. It's like, well, can't you fix them for us? I'm like, yeah, but that's like an extra $20,000 and you don't have that money or want to spend it. I can't sign off on these things. It became aggravating, even though they look like a good client. Another one, like I said, they just, duh, they just, you know, wanted more and more, it was too difficult. Let the client, I mean, let your, the marketers of your competitors get sucked into them so you can be free to steal their other clients away. Look at that, yeah, sorry. Well, I was wondering about the, how much do you start charging out for consulting, and like you said, there's, you know, this to this, and a lot of times for technical people, they don't really think about all the other things like lighting bills and all that stuff. How do you um, there's a there's a pain threshold. Personally I would never work, you know, I, I made a personal decision. I will never work again for less than a thousand dollars a day. That was like a decision I made. Honestly, there are sometimes I make upwards of 4000 a day, depending on what the client is. Like expert witness testimony is worth an awful lot of money. However, um, you really have to decide. Honestly, the industry standard for like companies, formal companies, is about 2K. If you want to be more cost competitive, you're working on your own. Maybe you want to look at 1200 a day, maybe 1500 
But again, there's a thing. People are not going to pay like 5000 a day. They'll laugh in your face. But if you're a $500 a day consultant, they'll be, why aren't you worth more? So again, it depends on who your market is. Because if you have really cheap, you know, you have cheap clients, that's one thing. I take it that's to say I'm finished as opposed to ask a question. I have an adjustment there. A lot of people in the technology community, like uh, IRSA, don't know how to communicate well. They can't sell themselves. It's easy for me to get $100 an hour. But if you want to get $250 an hour, you have to sell yourself. Why should I waste my time selling myself? I'll let someone else sell me. Mm. Hey, yeah. Um, what's your opinion about fixed price on a contract versus the daily rate? Um, I try to do fixed price sometimes because um, it's it's more com if you do fixed price and fixed scope that's one thing but make sure you estimate high when you do fixed price you know this way it's sort of like you go to your clients look it's a little bit more than if you paid by the hour but at the same time you know you know what it's going to cost you and more clients want fixed price in my opinion because they want to know exactly how much they're going to spend but be careful about fixed pricing travel expenses because there's one thing where I might be slightly screwed not much but slightly screwed more than I wanted to be last question yeah sorry thanks what do you think about uh, government contracting, particularly the federal? I personally, if you are on your own and you want to work the federal thing, that's one thing. You probably have to go through some subcontracting, you know, some other firm and subcontract yourself because you have to be DCAA compliant. Also, your pro your profits are limited to like eight percent or something like that. I prefer to stay away from government contracts because it's a lot of extra paperwork for a lot less profit, although the work can be more steady and long term. Because personally, I'm finding my, you know, my consulting engagements probably about two weeks long. You know, a government contract could be a, like two years long on average. So it's a catch-22. Thank you. So if you want to catch him in the hall, I know he'll talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at uh, 10 up, we'll start the next session with Jim Lichko. See you then. Thank you. Thanks, sir.